bite it. What does it taste like? Is it real? Yeah. <laughs> do you wash it? Oh no, no, like do you actually wash this it? This is what my head. Uh, we're here with. Emily B. Emily B. Where are you from, Emily? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. That's awesome. So for you, black guys or white guys? Black guys. Can you uh, elaborate as to why specifically black guys? Yes. Black guys are melanated and I want my children to survive. <laughs> and I know that the only way for them to survive in the future is for them to have melanin in their skin. So that's the way for me to, you know, make my legacy continue. <laughs> okay. Yo, yo! What this is this ridiculous! This is not funny! Umbrella She's up, she's up Oh level of shit you can't even understand What is good my people? We are live back again with another episode of the forecast. Now we as a collective talk about how we need our own all the time. But at some point there's gonna be a time where we can't talk about it anymore. We have to be about it. And it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. We're kept in the dark about a lot of our history, but we've done some great things. And our ancestors left us the blueprint. And the only difference between us and them is they understood what this society was about. Today, of course, we suffer from the illusion of inclusion. But back then, when you walk into a store and they won't even accept your money, it'll force you to make your own business. And they created these businesses in an environment where they weren't even thinking about a loan. They couldn't even go inside the bank. They understood they had to work together and put their resources together. And it didn't take them long to grow because where else are all the black customers going to go? And they like to tell us all the time, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. But black people in America are the only ones to ever pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Every other group got handouts from the government based on slave labor, by the way, from things like the Homestead Act and the GI Bill. And even today, immigrants coming into America benefiting from the civil rights movement. But we were still able to build Black Wall Streets all throughout America without any help because none was available. In fact, they did the opposite and destroyed it. But we were the only group in America to actually lift ourselves up by our bootstraps. And we could easily do it again if we get over the illusion of inclusion. But this time we will have to be prepared for when they come. But instead, so many of us try to assimilate into the society and try to change the system from within. But the foundation of this system is your destruction. That's what it was built on. They can't let you take that away because that'll destroy the whole system. You can't change the system, you have to destroy it. And when we really start to understand the system, we'll understand what we need to do. And we have to understand that it's in all areas. A lot of people have always talked about the racist history of organizations like the police. But a lot of people don't talk about the history of firefighters. How so many people weren't allowed to even be a firefighter because they were black. And even though there were firefighters in the late 1800s, of course the fire departments were segregated. Which is fine to have black firefighters for black neighborhoods. But you know they're going to get the worst equipment and they couldn't do their job. But in a lot of places, fire stations were all white until the 1960s. And we already know about how they sprayed children with water hoses. And it got to the point where people were fighting firefighters like they were the police. And even though after the civil rights movement, a lot of the policies were changed, you know that same mindset still exists. In Florida, a brother Simeon Brown was shot by an off-duty firefighter on Super Bowl Sunday. Now let's see what led to an off-duty firefighter shooting this brother. Right now at 6, new developments in a story you saw exclusively first on 10. Officers making an arrest in a Super Bowl block party shooting. And we're learning the suspect is a local firefighter. Let's go to Local 10's Christian De La Rosa live now outside the Port Lauderdale jail with the new information for us tonight. Christian. And BSO just releasing details confirming what we first reported on Tuesday. We now know that the Margaret Fire Department lieutenant is here at the main jail behind bars. Local 10 News is learning Margate Fire Rescue Lieutenant 39-year-old Lauren Brown was arrested just this morning. Mr. Lauren Brown. Detectives now confirming to Local 10 News he's the man who shot a gun into a moving vehicle on Super Bowl Sunday. My brother tapped me and said, go, go, because I see a gun. 22-year-old Simeon Brown says he was behind the wheel, driving around a traffic cone near Southwest 91st Terrace and 52nd Court in Cooper City, where neighbors were having a Super Bowl block party Sunday. They saw the car 
and like ambush the car. Brown's brother also in the vehicle says some of the neighbors at the party got angry. It's when they say Lorne took out his gun. And so my brother starts to drive and as he starts to drive, the dude let off two shots into the car. The brothers say they crashed their car and got out trying to get away. The fragment went up to my neck. Shot in the arm, the wounded man claims his shooter chased and pinned him to the ground. His brother calling 911. This is the same dude that just shot me. I said, sir, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And um, he, um, he, said, he said, I don't care. We should have killed you. The lieutenant has been with the Margate Fire Department since 2004. He is suspended without pay as he's facing some very serious charges, including premeditated attempted first degree murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Now, this brother, Simeon Brown, was in the car with three other people trying to take his girlfriend home. But I guess the white neighbors had the road blocked off because there was an unauthorized Super Bowl block party. So this brother trying to get to where he had to go had to drive around the cones. But that's when that white arrogance kicked in. They think they can just make up any kind of rule or law as they go along and you have to follow it. And you have to take all of their words as gospel. So when this brother drove around the cones, the white neighbors got mad and they start yelling and cursing at him. And this brother kept it moving. But as he drove off, one of them kicked his car. So after he dropped his girlfriend off, he came back through. And that's when the off-duty firefighter, Lorne Brown, approached his brother's car with a gun. And he pointed the gun at him and told him to get out the car. But if some random white boy pull out a gun on you and you don't have a gun, why would you get out the car? So then when his brother saw the gun, he tried to pull off. And that's when his white boy, Lorne Brown, shot two shots into the car and hit this brother, Simeon Brown. And they were able to get down the block a little bit, but they eventually crashed the car. So then this white boy, still with his gun, chased him down and then pinned down his brother Simeon Brown, even though he was already shot. And when his brother was trying to say, what are you doing? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. He was saying, I don't care. And he said, we should have killed you. Now, this brother Simeon Brown did survive and his white boy was arrested. But you already know they have to stay on code latest on a Margate firefighter who is now facing some serious charges after a Super Bowl block party shooting. The first responder turned suspect faced a judge today. Local 10 is live in Cooper City to tell us what happened in court. Alex Finney, fill us in. All right, so these cars just apparently came speeding through this Cooper City neighborhood. The lieutenant, when he contacted police, said this didn't happen just once. It happened twice. And as his attorney explained in court today, all of that mixed with the uncertainty as to what would happen next is what caused him to pull out that gun and fire his weapon. Margate Fire Lieutenant Lorne Brown, who's been with the department since 2004, went before a judge on Friday. Detectives believe Lorne shot into a moving car, the bullet hitting the driver, Simeon Brown. A fragment went up to my neck. This happened Super Bowl Sunday in Cooper City. Corone Brown, his brother, as well as his girlfriend and another woman, tell Local 10 they were on their way home and drove around traffic cones near Southwest 91st Terrace and 52nd Street, where a block party was happening. Neighbors became angry, and then what happened next? They saw the car and, like, ambushed the car. Took them by surprise. And so my brother starts to drive, and as he starts to drive, the dude let off two shots into the car. That dude they're referring to, Lieutenant Brown, who they say then chased them down on foot. Any comment from you guys about what we no learned from court today? Family saying nothing. His attorney saying this. It appears to be a traditional application of standard ground. In court saying the lieutenant was concerned for his and the neighbor's safety. And the fact that there are those out there that are making suggestions that this was somehow racially motivated disturbs him greatly. All right, and this is what the attorney was saying in court. You're seeing here, it's a very quiet neighborhood. It's, it's filled with a lot of children, so there was a concern there. Uh, apparently, uh, the lieutenant also, he's very nervous for his family right now. Uh, they've been getting some threats on social media. Of course, both sides to this story, still a lot to be unpacked here. But what I can tell you is that Lorna, Lorna does face charges of attempted first degree murder, as well as shooting into a vehicle, an aggravated assault with a firearm. At this hour, he is being held without bond. Now this white boy, Lorne Brown was charged, but he's still on the fire department payroll. I guess if a firefighter shoot an unarmed black man, he get a paid vacation too. And his brother, Simeon Brown lawyer said he was also the victim of a brutal arrest by the police after he was shot. 
But they did charge this white boy with attempted murder and held him without bond at first. But of course he used the good old I fear for my safety and the safety of others excuse. And his white boy lawyer said this is a traditional case of staying your ground. Even though he shot this unarmed brother as he was driving away from him. But of course this white boy has to make himself the victim somehow. Firefighters accused of shooting a driver during a Super Bowl block party in Cooper City. And now we're learning a Miami police officer is also involved. Local 10 News reporter Terrell Fournay is live outside the Miami Police Department with the details on this one. The story uh, just grows and grows, doesn't it, Terrell? It's very interesting how everything is unraveling, Christy. This officer for the city of Miami was off duty at the time, apparently enjoying the festivities of this block party that did not even have the proper permits to operate. But today we have a much clearer picture of what led up to the gunfire. A newly released arrest warrant details the circumstances about the night an off-duty Margate Fire Rescue Lieutenant opened fire on a man who was behind the wheel of a car in Cooper City. Simeon Brown was shot several times on February 2nd as he attempted to drive around a roadblock of a Super Bowl block party. Investigators say the party was not even authorized. We've learned off-duty Miami police officer Marlon Arena also drew his weapon that night. The document says he told investigators that he believed the vehicle was going to hit people on the roadway. He raised his hand up, ran in front of the vehicle, pointed his gun at the vehicle, and began yelling for the vehicle to stop. He identified himself as a police officer, but never showed his badge. My brother tapped me and said, go, go, because I see a gun. The victim says neighbors became angry when he tried to maneuver around the blocked road. The police officer and firefighter both walked towards his car, which had three passengers in it, including a Miami-Dade schools police officer. The firefighter, Lorne Brown, pulled the trigger, telling detectives, I got in front of them. I pulled my gun out. I told him to get out of the car as they hauled expletive up to us. That's when they took off and I shot two times at him at the driver. The fire lieutenant was later arrested and charged with attempted murder. This is the same dude that just shot me. I said, sir, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. He said, he said, I don't care. We should have killed you. So at this point, that uh, city of Miami police officer has not been charged with a crime, but we have reached out to the police department to see if perhaps he is facing any disciplinary action or even a comment about this situation so far. We have not heard back. Now it turns out the other person involved who also had a gun was an off-duty cop, Marlon Arena. He also approached the car with his gun out while he was off-duty, which is why they pulled off but they expect us just to obey their authority. Now the police said they didn't have a permit for the black party. They had no business blocking off the road, but they tried to pull this brother out of his car at gunpoint just because he drove around a cone that shouldn't have been there. And of course the cop Marlon Arena wasn't charged and the police won't speak on it. And even though the firefighter Lord Nate Brown was charged, he was released on bail and is still getting a paycheck from the fire department being paid by tax dollars. But these are the organizations that we fight to be a part of. But if we put half of that energy in the fight and create our own and fighting to protect them, then we'll be a lot better off because the system was never designed for us. It was meant to destroy us, not help us. And us trying to assimilate and be a part of that system is driving us crazy. And until we get over the illusion of inclusion and learn that we're all we got, then the same thing is going to keep happening over and over. We lived on, I don't know what would you call it, but something like a plantation to me. It belonged to several different white people. They all were family, I guess. And you couldn't leave. And if you did leave, they either come get you or, or have somebody kill you or whatever, whatever. That's what, that, that's what happened. <laughs> they do to your mother? They just had my mother, you know, the white men, you know, they, they, they just do what they want to do with her. And uh, I just wasn't big enough to do nothing. If I would have been, I don't know, probably wouldn't be. And this was in the 1950s or 40s? That was on through the 40s, in the 50s, all through the 50s, in part of the 60s. So what would the repercussions be if you tried to leave or if you tried to refuse what they wanted? Back in them days, it's, 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 it was kind of like you had to do what the white man said or I'd get killed. My dad and uncle, they made him dig a grave and killed him. 
<laughs> the boy. They kill him and bury him in his own grave. Jerry Dawson, they killed him. He lived right on the same place we lived at home. He left and said he wasn't coming back. They wouldn't get him. Bought him back, carried him right down there from his house. Killed him. Hung him up in a tree. They hung him? They killed him first. Casterized him and hung him up right from his house where his children, everybody could see him. Growing up, did you, were you fully aware, this is in the 40s and 50s, you know, the civil rights movement is just about to begin. Were you aware of what was going on in the rest of the country at that time for black people pursuing freedom? No. You, had, you weren't aware at all that this was, there was any pursuits for freedom in the 40s and 50s for us? No, not really. This morning here at Westwood School in Hamden, the parents of that fifth grade student who last week, the day after Martin Luther King Day, was cast as a slave in a class play. Well, the parents came here with the NAACP and some other parents to get some answers about this play from school officials. Hamden public school officials say that late last week, several days after a fifth grade teacher cast students in a play about the transatlantic slave trade, that the teacher used instructional resources that had not been approved. The scene starts with nameless slaves one and two getting pushed towards the ship. That couple's daughter was cast as one of the slaves. And a child is enacting the slave owner. The slave owner is instructed to crack a whip yes, at our children and to make sure they were scared. The Parkers say their daughter has been bullied since word got out that they complained about her role as a slave. She was crying. She was upset because a couple kids came to her and said, you got this girl at bars fired. You did this, and that's not the case. Rachel Grabars is the fifth grade social studies teacher whose intent was to use the play to teach the history of slavery. She's been suspended with pay pending the outcome of the investigation. The teacher under suspension who brought this play forward was asking, begging for, um, for material to teach her kids. She says because of problems with the internet at the school, the teacher didn't have access to her regular curriculum. You do not do the slave reenactments. You do not do blackface. There's ways to teach slavery that's critical, that's uh, uh, empathetic, and what people can learn. In addition to being a Hamden parent, he's an associate professor of history at Connecticut College, and the school system has asked him for his insight. We can sit down, look at the curriculum. I'm also part of the statewide measure to include more African-American Latinx history, so it is an effort. Hamden officer, now the focal point of an investigation after a video showing him appearing to have a student in a chokehold goes viral. Our Haley Brooks has been following this story and joins us with reaction from the student who's in that video. Haley. Donna Kevin and it all took place this morning at Camden Fairview High School. This student who appears to be in a chokehold is a ninth grader. We sat down with him today. Here's what he had to say. I'll be for my life. Dakarion Ellis is the student you can see in this video where Camden High School resource officer Jake Perry appears to have him in a chokehold. You can see Ellis appears to be lifted backward by his neck to the point where his feet are off the ground for 10 seconds. Ellis says it all started because of a fight with another student. A police officer pushed the kids off of me and he grabbed me and had started choking me and putting me on the glass. But it appears to have ended with Perry's arm around Ellis's neck as he's escorted off. 
Perry has since been relieved of his duties pending the investigation into his use of excessive force. The minute that I found out that there was what appeared to be misconduct on his behalf, uh, we took actions to stop it, that it couldn't continue. Police Chief Boyd Woody says Perry has been with the department for two years and has a sparkling record, but the family says the community knows a different story. I've got inboxes from people that don't know me, but they knew the officer that was in the video. And one word they described with him was a bully. It's clear the now viral video shook up the Ellis family. Another second or two, he would have been dead. Now, I didn't want to go bury my grandson. With an incident they say was totally preventable. He should have put his hand behind his back. That would have been the appropriate way to handle the situation. I didn't know what was going to happen. In a statement released by Police Chief Woody, he says Perry has been relieved of duty pending the investigation. The chief also clearly states that this type of misconduct will not be tolerated and says he will be transparent during the investigation. Civil rights leaders want RTA bus driver Ricky Wagner fired from his job and charged with a crime. They say his lies could have triggered serious racial problems in the community. Special contributor Natasha Williams has reaction. Let's go, fellas. Keep it going. As team crushers prepare for their state little league game, coach and dad Stephen Moore watches two of his three sons play, practice, and prepare for the big game. It's already hard enough on our youth that uh, we don't need no extra pressure on the young guys. These young guys earned a trip to the state little league baseball tournament, and Moore and other coaches who are also dads are keeping them busy. But for the most part, as parents, you got to stay busy with them. You got to know what your kids are doing. He could have incited a riot inside of our community. Dayton civil rights leaders from the NAACP, the SCLC, the Black Panthers, and the Black Legion hold a joint news conference about Ricky Wagner, the RTA bus driver who claimed he was attacked by three black guys when his bus broke down in West Dayton. Police investigations found that Wagner's claims could not be proven, but Wagner, who is white, was not charged with a crime. That has these leaders asking lots of questions, mainly why. If nothing else, he induced panic in the city. Um, if he fired the gun inside the city limits, that's another charge. All the leaders also want Wagner fired from the RTA. All African-American males in the community are not thugs and are not trying to shoot and rob. We have some very good young people in this community who are making some great contributions. Back at the baseball diamond, Moore agrees. He can't help but feel sad, though, that someone would stereotype kids like his and others in the black community. But he says he will use the situation to motivate his team and his sons to work harder to change some opinions. You got to be hands on. You got to try. You got to really put your whole hundred percent into it. This school district was thrust into the national spotlight after a parent asked another parent why he didn't stay in Mexico. Now this lawsuit shedding some light on the tension leading up to that moment. And why did you stay in Mexico? <gasps> this moment all stems from a group of students posting racist messages about black classmates on Snapchat. Now, four of those students who posted the messages are suing the Saline school system. The lawsuit states because the Snapchats did not occur on school grounds but on private property, the students should not have been suspended, alleging the students' rights were violated. This Saline High School senior says he was the target of one of those messages. Never thought in a million years I would be called, you know, the N-word. This is my first time ever experiencing race, like racial, you know, slurs towards me or center my name like that. So, from teammates? Uh, from teammates, yes. I hurt my feelings, this card me for life. Now other students are coming to his defense and the defense of others, creating a list of demands for administrators, including a formal way to report hate speech, a more diverse workforce within the school system, and diversity training for teachers, staff, and administrators. Students want these changes to be made within the next two months. I'm a junior, so I'm here for another year, but I, I want that to happen as soon as possible. I want, I want that change now. The Saline School Board plans on holding more meetings regarding race and open discussions about race within the next two weeks. Students walk out of class at OU after a journalism professor uses a racial slur. News Force Chase Horn is at OU tonight, and Chase, exactly how did this slur come up during the classroom? 
Well, Kevin, it was in Dr. Peter Gade's class. Apparently, they were having a discussion about using social media to show bias in students. That's when students say Gade thought that they were just trying to say, OK, Boomer, in a nice way. That's when Gade said the racial slur, comparing it to the phrase, OK, Boomer. The one that ended with an R, like Old South. Sarah Beth Cabrera says she was in class this morning when Dr. Gade compared saying, OK, Boomer, to the racial slur. She says students were shocked when the word came out of the mouth of a professor they all respect. We're told one student actually stood up to call Gade out while others just walked out. On their way out, Dr. Gade said, never have I been so disrespected in my life, which really had me taken aback because he's never been so disrespected in, my, in his life. Guevara says he spent the rest of the class trying to get everyone back on track and even used free speech to justify what he said. She says Gade eventually did apologize very briefly. In response to Gade using the slur during class, the OU Black Emergency Response Team made this statement on Twitter, quote, We do not condone or accept this behavior from any member of the OU community, regardless of occupation or student status. This will not be tolerated or accepted, and we will expect full action to be taken against the professor and college. Gate has been a member of the faculty for more than two decades, and Guevara says no journalism student can graduate without taking his class. We did reach out to the university. Interim President Joseph Harris sent us this statement, which reads in part, While the professor's comments are protected by the First Amendment and academic freedom, his comment and word choice are fundamentally offensive and wrong. We pressed a little harder, asking OU spokeswoman if that means Gade won't be punished. She told us that the investigation is ongoing and the university is determining what the next steps will be. As a Latino student, as a minority student, I don't want to go back to class. Like, I'm not even black and I don't want to go back to class and I can't imagine how my black brothers and sisters are feeling right now. Now, in about the last 10 to 15 minutes, the university did send us another statement about how they plan to move forward. The statement does start by saying that the First Amendment does protect the professor from any sanctions, so there will not be any sanctions, but it does go on to say that the administration has met with students throughout the day, and again on Thursday, students that were in the class itself will have an opportunity to meet with Gaylord College leadership to voice concerns and have a conversation about moving forward. The student we spoke with says she would at the very least like to see Gade have racial sensitivity training at the very most. She would like for another professor to take over his class for the rest of the semester. Still struggling to cope with the tragic loss of Kobe Bryant. And while most are praising Brian's career and the impact he made on L.A., one teacher was caught on tape bad-mouthing him. Yes, and that video has gone viral. CBS 2's Dave Lopez talked to students at where this all happened in East L.A. This is one of the most selfish players. He ruined the Lakers. He put him probably two to three years in a rebuilding at the end of his career. The man talking about Kobe Bryant on this cell phone video has been identified by students as Mr. Brian Bailey, the band teacher at Garfield High School in East Los Angeles. What made him a great basketball player also made him a horrible basketball player and a horrible person. It was Monday morning during beginning guitar class when he asked the students how their weekend was. According to 14-year-old Wayne Gray, who was in the class, two of the students were wearing Kobe Bryant jerseys. They answered, it was a terrible weekend because of what happened to Kobe. And then Gray said for the next four minutes, he recorded what Mr. Bailey said about Kobe. Someone has to get this on camera, so that's what I did. Is there any reason that God's green earth you need to take a helicopter from Orange County to Calabasas? The voice of the student mumbling what appears to be an objection, but we can't clearly make out what he said. It's bad, but it's his opinion, so you know we can't really do anything about that. He said no one in the class tried to interrupt him or stopped him. They were just shocked, and the video went viral on campus today. I didn't think he was going to talk negative about him. I thought he was going to say something good. But he cheated on his wife. He raped a young girl. He was a selfish basketball player. Someone needs to say it. No comment from the school district, and our requests to talk to Mr. Bailey were ignored. In a message sent out this morning to all parents, the school principal explained that negative comments had been made about Kobe Bryant in a classroom, no details, and it also said, we also ask that everyone please be sensitive to others when discussing tragic events both inside and outside of the classroom. If you ask me why did you record me, I'm going to tell them because you were being disrespectful. And no response from the district when asked, did Mr. Bailey go too far or will he be disciplined?
It's been really crazy, honestly. At Camus High School. I'm sure a lot of students are just looking forward to getting back to normal. It was a week marked with safety concerns, planned walkouts, a school lockdown, and on Friday, Principal Liza Sikora's resignation. Today, I uh, accepted the resignation of uh, Camus High School Principal Dr. Uh, Liza Sikora. On Tuesday, Superintendent Jeff Snell placed Dr. Sikora on administrative leave after she received threats in response to a personal Facebook post she wrote about Kobe Bryant the day he died. The district was already investigating the post, which said, not gonna lie, seems to me that karma caught up with a rapist today. Sakura later apologized. It was, it, was, it was in poor taste. I regret that. But many students feel the damage was already done. It's been really hectic. A lot of my classes have been interrupted. Aside from that, there's been mass hysteria at the school. Lots of students have been leaving. It shouldn't have been said. And so I think the resignation was the best choice moving forward because Personally, I know that after this, um, I wouldn't have been able to trust her as my principal. We found former Camus students who disagreed. I'm really sad that she's gone now. Tyler Toddley and Ozzy Gonzalez graduated in 2018. They started a Facebook page called Friends of Liza Sakura. We just felt a need to kind of try to find a group of people to rally behind her. I think that someone in her position with that sort of influence over the students should be more considerate of what she had to say, but I don't think this response is, I don't think it's right. I think it's out of line. I think it's been blown out of proportion completely. Following her resignation, the district shared a statement from Dr. Sakura that read in part, students and staff deserve to have a learning environment free of disruptions. You know, having a decision like this um, allows for some closure and uh, maybe we can move forward and um, you know get back to business. It's what students want for their school and community. Because because of your hurt and your it's trauma, you want to take it out on on exactly. what people need to be recognizing. But he's not a rapist. He was one, he he's was not a rapist. A legend. He, exactly. He, he's a hero he and a hero. Was he was more than guilty. basketball, yeah. basketball like, that's I didn't feel guilty. support everything he said with his daughter that she, and that women could be part of the NBA. Okay, that so you just so, You don't even know he raped her. Ever to ignore. His rape, to ignore his victim. She to don't ignore know that. They dropped the charges. They dropped the charges. She even came out and said she didn't even get raped. You don't know that, but you still found something. She, 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 she dropped the charges. She dropped the charges. Possibly did it. So why did she drop the charges? Then why did she drop the charges? Why did she drop the charges? Why did she drop the charges? Bragged about it to her coworkers. How did she brag about it? Obviously, you didn't follow she it. She bragged about his manhood. She don't even know what she's talking about. It's very much a public document. Nigga, come back. Nigga, I just drove an hour and a half to come see this shit. You gonna do that stupid shit? That's what I'm saying. I just, I just bought my kids from San Antonio to see it. You gonna do that stupid shit? And you, and you just ruined it. Yeah. I'm you see so everybody sorry. over here taking. You ain't sorry. You're, You're not sorry. You're not sorry. You're not sorry. So why are you saying it then? Okay. So why are you saying it then? So why are you saying you're sorry? So why are you saying you're sorry? You don't mean it. Nigga, Kobe ain't no fucking rapist. They dropped the charges. He's a rapist. No, he's not. They dropped the charges. No, he's not. I want to hear you. Give me one second. This is part of this. It's right. not just about Kobe. It's about all the misconceptions on how rape and rape cases are treated. Just be, hold on. Oh, you, you, you start crying and shit. Because, because that, that is important. That, that I'm really happy you're recording you now did. while you mock me while I cry. But what I'm telling you is, it's your trauma that you're hurt. Stop, forget that. Not forget that. You don't know that. You don't know that. You just wrote it. You don't know You don't know that. Just he just did it. Okay, so what the fuck? Why would you do that? I know. If you want people to have compassion for you, why don't you have compassion for someone's death? And people are mourning. out of this for me. That's what I'm saying. Why exactly. do it then? I'm saying. Well, you, want people, you, know, you, you want people. No, you want people. Listen, what is the compassion you want. I wasn't looking no, for compassion. The, the compassion you're sure asking for is to feel for rapists and feel for... No, no, not really. Feel for people been raped. What's your name? Feel for the court system, right? What's your name? That's what you said. Like, that's, that's what you asked. Yeah. That's, that is exactly what you asked. You, you don't get passion. Be, be for proud people of who went through the legal system. Because it's, a rape. What's your name? You want compassion. Be, be proud of it. Right? So you should have compassion for people mourning someone's death. I have compassion for the people mourning his death. I mourned his death. If you did, you wouldn't have done that. You ruined our You wouldn't have done that. What we're doing right now. You know what? In my memory, it was when he raped somebody. How did that ruin? Were you there? Were you there? Don't know that. 
Yeah, okay, but I'm innocent until proven guilty, dumbass. So what's your name? Innocent until proven guilty. What's your name? What's your name? No, this is gonna go on social media. She's a coward. She's not gonna say her fucking name. What is your name? From what? You don't even know what I do. For vandalism. That's no, vandalism. Okay, so, vandalism. so if, if you have if, if you if you believe that you that, that ain't nothing gonna happen, then what's your name? Tell your story. Tell your story to the camera. My name is Kate. Yeah. Kate, Kate what? Give me a second. You can look it up and then you'll go. Yeah, she'd probably do this. My name is Kate. Kate Branham. I go by Kate Voice. You're crying because you don't know if someone was raped or not raped. You haven't listened. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. It's not about Kobe. I mean, it is. It's not just about his victim. It's not just about me. It's not about, did this person rape this person? Did this person do this? It's about the court systems. Okay, but that's to not To say his that fault. because he's, he's, he didn't do rape because he wasn't charged of it? He was charged. He was acquitted. Talk to me. And why was he acquitted? Why was he not in power? decided to not go for it. Correct? She dropped the cases and she took and the money. And why did she drop the case? She took the money, because though. Because the, the prosecution said the, sto the case wasn't strong enough. That's it? That's all That's that happened? That's it. I just want to follow up on this Gail King story really quick, Rev. You've been talking about it for the past several days. We brought it up a couple days ago. I, I, I still got to say, I, I just again, let's What's put it in on? the starkest terms. A black woman who is a journalist has her life threatened from a, a, a guy who has 39 million people. The post is still up. The post is still up. She faces threats and abuse. Her children are now facing threats 24 and abuse. hour security she now gail king now has to have 24 hour security and i'll be damned have i read the new york times editorialize about it no, no. what's all your bullshit about protecting journalists when you have a black woman whose life was threatened nothing there wall street journal nothing wait what, what are you doing viacom what are you CBS? doing where's viacom cbs mm, has the usa voice. today done it Snoop. where are you a black female journalist's life has been threatened. She and her children fear for their lives. And you aren't writing about this? Well, where's corporate America? Because there are people Where who is corporate employ America? Him. Where is Viacom? Our partnerships. Let me them. say it again. A black female journalist fears for her life this morning. Her children are facing abuse and threats. Well, guess what? I think it's dangerous when Donald Trump threatens members of the press. And I think it's dangerous when pop culture figures threaten members of the press, especially a black woman doing her job who is only doing her job you know what we can have a debate whether the question should have been asked or not we're so beyond that right now we are so beyond that right now what's the no conspiracy way. of silence about new york times why aren't you writing about this what about you washington post wall street journal where are you viacom where are you a black woman has gone to bed a journalist in fear of her life for what five six days and there's a conspiracy of silence yeah, i heard lebron did I, did I hear correctly lebron yeah. liked the post yes and 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 name one person on this set name one person in entertainment doing talk shows who did who would post something like this that wouldn't be fired in three seconds and by the way so less thought, than they were filming yesterday with martha stewart um he, he they were filming yesterday for vh1 the martha and snoop oh series God. potluck party challenge it's supposed to be on the air tomorrow night viacom. yesterday Vi that, that's viacom yes, who, by the way. yesterday they were filming martha stewart was there william shatner was there tamar braxner was there trey songs was there they were all there working with snoop on set 
to film an edition of the show that will show And they um, say he speaks week. for himself. They say he walked it back. He did an additional post, still leaving the threatening, profanity-laced post up that millions of people can watch right now. He did an additional post, sort of trying to make Gail look older, trying to do little dog whistles while sort of saying maybe we're not violent. It was not an apology. He did not pull it back. He actually made it worse. As far as the outcome is concerned, like it or not, it's over. I've had some uh, verdicts that I haven't liked in my life, but I tried to honor it, make the most of it, and move on, and that's what I think we should do now. Uh, the other thing is this Kobe Bryant, uh, Gail King thing. Uh, I'm not the most objective guy when it comes to Gail, Gail King. Uh, a few years back on national TV, she made a comment that it was inappropriate for me to be visiting my ex-wife grave, something that me, my uh, family, and uh, friends on special occasions and birthdays and Christmas and stuff had done for years, and I couldn't understand why it was any of her business and why she would say that on national TV. Uh, I know this thing about Kobe, she's going to claim journalistic integrity. A whole lot of people got journalistic integrity, didn't feel that this was the right time to do that. Uh, there will be plenty of time in the future to bring up all aspects of Kobe's life. Right now, we should be celebrating the greatness of Kobe Bryant. God bless Kobe and his family. All right, and we back on the forecast. Now, history has a way of repeating itself because we don't understand our history, even right here in America, enough. And today, we're still having the same conversations they had 50 or even 100 years ago. But in reality, we already know what we have to do. We can't wait on anybody else to create institutions for us. We have to create our own. The problem of police brutality isn't a new issue. And since the beginning, there have been groups of people right there to fight back. We know about popular groups like the Black Panthers, the deacons of defense. But what they understood is it doesn't matter what your beliefs are. They were willing to put them to the side because they understood the bigger issue of us being killed, our children being killed. And they understood that if a cop walked into a crowd of black people who are armed, they're going to think twice about violating somebody's rights because it's never fun when the rabbit got the gun. And even though it was the civil rights movement that paved the way, it was the black power movement that forced them to talk to the civil rights leaders in the first place because they feared the militant Negro. And when they got tired of getting beat up, that's when they decided to fight back. In Pennsylvania, the York riot of 1969 started after a white boy shot into a crowd of black people and didn't get arrested. It started the year before in 1968 when this white boy started yelling at a group of black teenagers talking about they were making too much noise. And then he shot into the crowd, injuring a man and a woman. But when the police came, they didn't even arrest him. He made up a story saying he was trying to stop a break-in. So then this white boy went back to his apartment and then shot a pellet gun and a shotgun into the crowd, injuring 10 people. But back in 1968, they were tired of that. And by the end of the night, his house was firebombed and burned to the ground. But it was already tension. And then a month later, at a high school football game, the police released dogs on black teenagers, and seven of them were hospitalized. So then by 1969, when a group of black teenagers got into a fight with a white gang, it eventually led to the riot. And as people started shooting and throwing rocks, 12 people ended up getting hurt in a six block radius. And then as the fighting continued the next day, a cop ended up getting shot and killed while he was in an armored truck. And of course, all the white gangs talked about revenge because they understand what has to happen when you take one of theirs. Best believe they're going to punish you somehow. But some black people in the black neighborhoods were shooting at anybody white or looked like they didn't belong in their neighborhood. And white gangs were shooting at any black person in their neighborhood. Then on July 21st, a sister Lily Bell Allen who came from South Carolina to York to visit her parents, was shot and killed in front of them and her sister. Now, our sister Hattie Dickinson was riding around looking for a grocery store because they're from out of town. And then they saw a white gunman in a second story window. And then they realized they were surrounded by a white gang who all had guns. And they tried to turn the car around, but it stalled out on them. And more and more armed whites started to come outside. So this sister and her family started to panic her parents were saying prayers in the back seat. And so the sister Lily Bell Allen 
tried to get in the driver's seat after her sister got scared. This sister got out of the car, waving her arm, saying, please don't shoot, please don't shoot. But then multiple people started shooting at her for no reason. They shot at them from the street, from the window, from the rooftops, and ended up killing the sister Lily Bell Allen. They shot more than 100 rounds at them, and the sister got hit with several different types of bullets. Like some of them were handguns, some of them were shotguns. This sister Lily Bell Allen was shot so many times and died laying in the pool of blood under her car with her parents and her sister right there. And after the shooting, more National Guards were called in and a state of emergency was declared. And after an emergency curfew was imposed, the violence started to calm down over the next three days. And even though people knew who was involved in the murder of Lily Bell Allen, no one said anything because they thought it was even. They said one black person had been killed and one white person. And by the time it was over, more than 80 people were reported injured and more than 100 were arrested. Then in 2001, 10 white people were arrested and charged for Lily Bell Allen murder. Seven of them took plea deals. Another one pleaded no contest and was sentenced to a light punishment. Two of them were convicted. But the former mayor and cop, Charles Robinson, who was also involved, was acquitted by an all-white jury. Now, the point is, these are the same people that we look for justice from. And we're still shocked when we don't get it. In Texas, a brother Darius Tarver was shot and killed by Denton police. So let's go back and try to figure out how this brother ended up getting shot and killed by the police. Today, a violent confrontation in Denton ended with a police officer injured and a UNT student dead. CBS 11's J.D. Miles is live in the 200 block of Inman Street. You have been there most of the day. Tell us what went down. Doug, Denton police still haven't released the name of the student who witnesses and his friends say was acting erratically and damaging property here at the apartment complex where he lives before officers arrived and shot him after he stabbed one of them. Family members of a UNT student gathered outside his apartment while Denton police and the Texas Rangers collected evidence around the scene where he died. And I'm still lost for words. Good guy. Definitely. Kenton Nelson says his roommate was like any other UNT student living at this off-campus apartment complex until his behavior changed about a week ago. Uh, up until last weekend, very coherent, very good guy, couldn't have cooked for you, come check on you, so forth, and anything, man, I'm getting ready to go to work, worked hard, worked two jobs, and then all of a sudden, like I said, last weekend something occurred and changed all that, and it burned this past weekend. But Nelson and other witnesses say they woke up at 3 a.m. to the sounds of the man banging on doors and destroying light fixtures in the hallways. He came in and he just starts talking about God and how he wants, how God wants him to live in the darkness. I just heard commotion in my sleep and I thought I was dreaming and then it was, there was a whole bunch of people yelling and then I heard two gunshots. Denton's police chief says those gunshots were fired by his officers after they tried to not only calm the student down, but also subdue him with a taser because he was holding a frying pan and a meat cleaver. The taser initially was effective. He dropped down to the ground, but almost immediately stood back up. They tried a second cycle of the taser. Again, it was ineffective, and then he charged full on. At some point, stabbing an officer in the shoulder, and then we had another, a separate officer discharge his firearm. Uh, more than once striking him. Fortunately, the officer who was stabbed is expected to recover. Uh, friends of this student do not believe any substance abuse led to this violent behavior, but a toxicology test during his autopsy should provide a clearer picture. Now, it started at about 3 o'clock in the morning when his brother Darius Tarver was having some sort of issue. For some reason, his brother was in the hallway destroying light fixtures banging on people's doors, and screaming prayers about how God wants him to be in the dark. So some of his neighbors called the police, and when they got there, they said this brother had a frying pan and a meat cleaver in his hand. Then they claimed his brother Darius Tarver was coming towards them and committing the sin of ignoring their commands. So then the police said they tried to tase him. But they said he fell and got back up, and the taser wasn't working. So then the police said this brother charged at him and stabbed one of the cops in the shoulder. And that's when they said one of the cops, who they didn't name and are protecting, shot at least two times and killed this brother. So now, of course, the police are going to investigate themselves. And they're already trying to figure out how to blame the victim, talking about drugs may have affected his behavior before he even had an autopsy. 
And even though this brother Darius Tyrell's dad and the granddad is affiliated with the police, you already know who they're going to stay on call with. Father says he needs answers after police shot and killed his son. Denton police say 23-year-old Darius Tarver stabbed one officer, then charged the others. Police say he was armed with a meat cleaver in one hand and a frying pan in the other. Officers tried a taser but say that did not stop him. Dion Anglin is live in Collin County where she spoke to Tarver's father. Dion. Yeah, that's right. Darius Tarver's father says uh, he is shocked over the reports that describe his son's behavior at his Denton apartment complex. Kevin Tarver Sr. has a law enforcement background. He says he wants the investigation to run its course with transparency. Just a kid that any father would be proud of, you know. He come from a good background, you know, my father's a pastor, I'm a pastor. And, you know, he was raised the right way, taught to do the right things, never been in trouble, never been in jail, you know, wasn't on drugs, no alcohol. Kevin Tarver Sr. describes his son, Darius Tarver, shot and killed by Denton police Tuesday morning. Investigators say the 23-year-old UNT criminal justice major was behaving erratically at 3 a.m., armed with a frying pan, meat cleaver, and another object. Several people called 911 because Tarver was banging on doors, quoting scriptures, and trying to get into apartments. Kevin Tarver is a chaplain with the McKinney Police Department. He says the description couldn't be further from the son he and his ex-wife raised. He already had one degree and he was excited about getting to complete this uh, bachelor's, which he was getting ready to complete in North Texas, and, you know, he was graduating in May. Kevin Tarver insists his son did not do drugs. In fact, resisted taking medication when he was ill. He wonders if a serious car crash his son survived just over a week ago was in any way related to his behavior. Photos the family shared on Facebook show the totaled vehicle. Tarver says his son had to be cut free from the car and for a time was unresponsive. He was released from the hospital two days after the crash. When he was released, yeah, we just were thankful for God to spare his life. Investigators say a Denton officer was stabbed during Tuesday's incident and is expected to fully recover. Officers used a taser twice trying to subdue Tarver. And I spoke to the Rangers and I spoke to the chief and, uh, you know, uh, I'm allowing them to do what they say they're going to do and um, I'm giving them the confidence and, and uh, they're saying they're going to give me the transparency I asked for so if I get that I can deal with it and I can have peace. The officer who fired his weapon, killing Tarver, is on administrative leave pending the investigation. Now, this brother wasn't on drugs, and he didn't have a record. He's never been in jail, and he was about to get another degree. And it turns out this brother was in a serious accident a week before, and he most likely had a brain injury. That's probably why he kept saying, God wants me to be in the dark. And even though he was in a bad accident where he had to be cut out of the car, the hospital released him after two days. And they wanted to try to say drugs affected his behavior, but he didn't even take the medication after he got into an accident. And his brother just needed some help, but they aren't there to help us. And until we build institutions or organizations that we can call, then there is nobody there to help us. And his brother Darius Tarver was able to survive a horrible car accident, but he couldn't survive an encounter with the police. The father of a man who was killed by Denton police says the shooting was not justified. CBS 11's J.D. Miles joining us live from McKinney where that father is now demanding, I understand, the body cam video that he was able to watch in private. He wants that now made public. Doug, there were tears in Kevin Tarver's eyes as he recalled today watching his son's final moments alive. He expected to see something that justified the officer's actions, but instead says the video suggests Denton police lied about what happened. It was in the stairwell of this apartment complex last month where Denton police say DJ Tarver approached officers with a frying pan and a meat cleaver. The department says officers were forced to open fire after a taser failed to subdue the 23-year-old UNT criminal justice major. That's what the student's father says he thought he would see when today police showed him the body cam video. I just wanted answers, you know. I'm pro-police. 
and I'm pro-justice. Tarver is a chaplain who works with McKinney Police and serves on the city's police advisory council. But he says the video tells a different story. He's not threatening anybody. He's not an imminent threat. He's not a threat at all. You know, from watching the, the cam, all you see is him standing like this with a uh, pan in his hand. We don't see a knife. We don't see the, the meat cleaver. Tarver admits his son isn't acting right, but insists there was no sign of aggression. He's looking up, saying, my heavenly father, my God, my God. He says an officer opened fire after a taser caused his son to involuntarily lurch forward. With over 5,000 volts of electricity running through you, you can't be still. So he begins to, to holler and scream. And, and, and when he does run forward after being tased, there's nothing in his hands. Mm -hmm. But all we hear is like, pow, he's down on the ground. He says officers never tried to restrain Tarver and shot him again when he got up. Denton police would only release a statement about the father's concerns, which says the investigation by the Texas Rangers will evaluate whether any criminal violations of law occurred. The internal affairs investigation will determine whether use of force was appropriate. Now, the father wants to see the name of the officer who fired and the body cam video both publicly released. Now, Denton police, you may remember, initially said that an officer was stabbed, but on the video, Tarver says that an officer mentions there's no sign of a knife and that there's no mention anywhere on the video of a stabbing. Now, it turns out this whole thing was on body cam, and his dad saw the video, and it conflicted the cop's story. His dad said he didn't even see a meat cleaver, let alone see a cop get stabbed. His dad said he wasn't approaching the cops. He was looking in the sky calling for God. And then only after he was tasered did he come forward. And after he was tased and got up, his dad said he didn't have anything in his hands. But the police still shot him anyway. And even though Darius Tarver's family got to see the video, of course they're going to keep the video private. But his dad said he wanted the video to be public. But that blue wall only extends so far. But there's no other way around it. We have to create our own institutions. If people know there's consequences or punishments when they mess with you, they're going to think twice about it. We just have to understand we are all we got. And we don't have any other choice but to put our petty differences and beliefs aside so that we can do what we have to do. And our blood being shed should be enough motivation to do that. But until we do, the same cycle will just keep repeating itself. I think we disproportionately stop whites too much and minorities too little. 95% of your murders, and murderers, and murder victims fit one MO. You can just take the description, Xerox it, and pass it out to all the cops. They are male minorities, 15 to 25. That's true in New York, it's true in virtually every city. And that's where the real crime is. She's got to get the guns out of the hands of the people that get killed. She's got to be one of them. Spend the money for a lot of cops in the street. Put those cops where the crime is, which means in the minority neighborhoods. So it's one of the unintended consequences is people say, oh my God, you are arresting kids for marijuana that are all minority. Yes, that's true. Why? Because we put all the cops in the minority neighborhoods. Yes, that's true. Why do we do it? Because that's where all the crime is. And the way she get the guns out of her kids' hands is to throw them against the wall and frisk them. And then they start, they say, oh, I don't want that, I don't want to get caught, so they don't bring the gun. They still have a gun, but they leave it at home. Costa and a friend came in these doors for a birthday celebration, according to the video surveillance and the city's investigation. But that celebration went horribly wrong. We've blurred the video that shows Julia Acosta in brown hair and a friend at the bar on the patio. A statement from the African-American bartender says that they'd been served two beers before he came on duty at 4 p.m. He brought them one more each that they ordered. He then began having problems with them being loud and disruptive, asking them to quiet down on several occasions. The video from another patio camera shows him gesturing to his manager, appearing to inform him of the problems. That manager told the bartender to remove her third beer. The bartender says Acosta became verbally abusive when he did that, saying to her friend that this is why she, quote, hated black people and, quote, hated representing them. 
The bartender then told Acosta and her friend they were causing a scene and would have to leave. He told city investigators she then said he would, quote, never be more than a black piece of expletive bartender. The bartender repeatedly asked Acosta to leave, and she then said, quote, I hate black people, I really do. Black people are the lowlifes of society, and it's for that reason she doesn't have to listen to a black piece of expletive like me. The bartender says Acosta continued shouting and cussing as the manager escorted her off the patio and through the restaurant to the entryway. The manager told city investigators the women sat down there and Acosta refused to leave until he threatened to call police. He said he didn't hear racial slurs but heard Acosta loudly say, quote, she hated black people. Another server told the city she heard that comment and also heard Acosta say, quote, the KKK will be calling on you. Elsa says they want all of their customers to feel comfortable and at home, but they say what happened on this patio should never happen. They will not allow people to attack their employees. Everybody out there is saying it's a video that's making the rounds. It's on Twitter, it's on Instagram, it's on Snapchat, everywhere. A student at Dulles High School in Sugarland recorded a teacher using the N-word not once, but several times. It appears he was trying to make a point about young people using the term casually to each other, particularly in rap music. You can get your point across without actually using that derogatory word. I mean, so he would have, I mean, as an educator, he should have been able to get his point across without you know, making anyone feel bad about themselves. The superintendent for Fort Bend ISD weighed in on Twitter saying, quote, racial slurs are unacceptable behavior by any standard and will not be tolerated in Fort Bend ISD. This is already under investigation, will be dealt with swiftly and assertively. We went by the suspected teacher's home, but he quickly shut the door and declined to comment. We're not naming or identifying him since he hasn't formally been disciplined. <laughs> No matter what his intent, right now, in this day and climate, most students say no excuses. And I think it's pretty racist. We shouldn't have teachers like this. Most people are offended, and they don't like them anymore. Fort Bend ISD tells me that this staff member is on leave while they're doing an investigation. And just in the last five minutes, the district sent me a copy of the letter that was sent out to parents this afternoon. It reads in part that I want you to know that we take incidents like this very seriously. The video of the employee is very disappointing and does not reflect the environment that we strive to cultivate. A Valley CEO caught on video calling his Uber driver, who's an ASU student, a racial slur. ABC 15 Zach Crenshaw going over that video tonight and Zach the driver wants to see some changes. Yeah, most of all, he wants to see that passenger change his use of words, but he also wants to see Uber take these incidents of racism more seriously and investigate a little quicker. All of this exploding because the passenger wanted to get in the front seat. Are, are you serious with me? No, I don't like when people sit in the front period. I'll cancel and refund you. Randy Clark says most of his Uber rides That's are not car, like what um, you just heard. I got two iPads for games and music. His car, pure joy for passengers. In fact, he has a nearly perfect rating on Uber. You got the drinks, you got the snacks. The ASU senior has been driving four and a half years with over 14,000 rides under my belt. One ride though. I was sexually assaulted before. Changed everything. He was drunk grab my crush. That's why Randy now has these signs. Front seat use is reserved for parties of three or more. Friday night, a rider tried to hop in up front. Am I sitting in the back? No. Yeah, I don't like to sit there. I don't like the people sitting in the front. Both men agreed to cancel the trip, but the passenger then jumped in the back. I'm here. I'm sitting sir, here in the back please seat. please leave my vehicle. Is that because I'm white? No, sir. You're a You're a Oh man, people died for that word. I was in shock and I shamelessly felt like laughing because I did not know this was actually real. Randy quickly filed a complaint with Uber, but had a gut feeling. Something told me inside that this man is probably a business owner. He did some digging and determined it was Hans Berglund, founder and CEO of Agroplasma, an organic fertilizer company based in Tempe. This man probably is employing people of color. Randy says he hopes Uber bans Hans from the app. And while he's moving on to new rides. I would love to get an apology. The Seattle couple. We, we celebrated one year together a couple weeks ago. It was wonderful. Alex Dugdale and Kylie Steinbach say they never received racist remarks about their relationship until last week. We need people to know 
that this kind of thing still happens. This kind of uh, racial harassment and bigotry, it still happens. It was on St. Patrick's Day. They ordered a lift to pick them up in Lake City. We asked if we could make a stop at 7-Eleven and he said no and we said okay. They say they barely traveled a block before the driver said this. You know what, you guys can get out here. I'm canceling your ride, get out of my car. I couldn't imagine what we possibly could have done in that time, like why? on earth <laughs> are we being pulled, like told to get out of the car. Kylie says at that point, the driver who had a camera mounted to the dashboard turned it so it was facing her. At the same time, her boyfriend Alex got out of the car and walked around to open her door. As I was getting Kylie out of the car and I said, well, sweetheart, he might not like mixed race couples. They turned to leave, but say the driver wasn't done. He rolled down the window and he screamed at me, you're an you he said that word, he said the N word, and because of that, it, it took it to a whole nother level of, you know, harassment. When they reported it to Lyft, they say they were disappointed by the initial response. He didn't bother asking what the altercation was. He just said, okay, we won't pair you with this driver again. In a statement, Lyft says they do not tolerate discrimination and are investigating the incident. The company notes they've reached out to the driver and the couple, and both parties are alleging inappropriate behavior. That is completely false. The driver is wrong. We did nothing wrong or inappropriate. Now the couple has filed a police report and posted about it on social media. This should not be tolerated, will not be tolerated. Together, they want to send that message. In Seattle, Natalie Swaby, King 5 News. Now, the couple wants Lyft to review the driver's dash cam footage. They also say they want an apology and for Lyft to cut ties with this driver. In Lyft's statement, the company said these allegations are extremely concerning. Again, Lyft says it is investigating what took place. This all happened on Tuesday here on the Chapman University campus. Uh, since then, that student was arrested, taken to jail, and he is now out on bail, but it is far from over. Uh, apparently, this was all caught on a cell phone video by a student who was also in that classroom. We had to bleep a lot of it out. The language is bad, the, the um, content is bad, but here's exactly what happened. Hey, hey, you got in here? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> this student has been identified as 21-year-old Dayton Kingery. On the video, he admits to being drunk in class, saying he'd been drinking all day, in fact. His behavior begins to escalate, though, and that's when the other students have had enough, and they tell him to get out of the classroom. You don't know who I am, guy. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I <laughs> bury you. I'm worth, like, $50 million. So the other students basically have to force him out of the classroom. They toss him what they think is his backpack with the computer inside. It turns out it wasn't his, so he throws it to the ground and then stomps on it before walking away. Campus police and officers from the Orange Police Department caught up with him, though. They arrested him. He apparently didn't go willingly, though. Officers had to tie up his legs and arms and actually carry him off campus. Now, this is his mugshot. Kingery was arrested for felony vandalism for damaging the other student's computer. He's also accused of making criminal threats and elder abuse in the assault of a campus security guard who is over the age of 65. The president of Chapman University posted this to Twitter, saying this afternoon a disruption took place in Chapman classroom, in a Chapman classroom that included racist and homophobic statements along with inappropriate and disrespectful behavior. I also want to extend my deepest apologies to the black and LGBTQIA community who were specifically targeted during this incident. Uh, the president of the university goes on to say that appropriate uh, disciplinary action will be taken against this student. What that is remains to be seen. A lot of students on social media wondering if that student's going to be allowed back in the classroom or back on campus at all. Rush Limbaugh is, as you know, a conservative firebrand and a radio talk show icon. Now he is battling advanced lung cancer. Limbaugh is at the center of a new controversy after President Trump awarded him the medal, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. As Limbaugh faces a deadly battle with lung cancer, President Trump Later has winter, awarded him the Presidential Medal of, Medal of Freedom. Rush Limbaugh, thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. Limbaugh has lived the American dream. 
But at the same time, he's used his words to make a mockery of that dream, sometimes sharing xenophobic, misogynistic, and racist sentiments with the masses. This is how he chose to speak of a New York Yankee icon the day he died in 2010. Steinbrenner has passed away at age 80. That cracker made a lot of African-American millionaires. Limbaugh attacked those who didn't share his political ideas with a fervor and harshness that stood out amongst his talk show peers. As you might know, I care deeply about stem cell research. When actor Michael J. Fox, who suffers from Parkinson's disease, did this ad for a Democratic candidate who supported stem cell research, Limbaugh pounced. This is Michael J. Fox. He's got Parkinson's disease. And it's in this commercial, he is exaggerating the effects of the disease. He is moving all around and shaking, and it's purely an act. It's After outrage over his comments, Limbaugh apologized the next day, saying, I will bigly, hugely admit that I was wrong. But he reserved a great deal of his racist comments for one man. Barack Obama, both as president and as a candidate. In 2007, as Obama campaigned on hope and change, Limbaugh debuted a racist parody of Puff the Magic Dragon, sung by a candidate for chairman of the Republican National Committee. Barack the Magic Negro. Then Limbaugh defended his decision to air it. Every one of you out there that think you've got something here on Barack the Magic Negro, I'm going to try to help you and save you. What kind of class is that? <laughs> Zero class. Meanwhile, Al Sharpton goes out the front door. Yes, I spoke a little Negro dialect there. I can do that when I, uh, when I want to. Al Sharpton goes out and in the front door. In and out the front door. A man who makes his living coaching a college team on a basketball court tonight in court, facing a judge and facing charges after the death of a man who mistook the coach's car for an Uber. Good evening, everyone, at 11 o'clock. I'm Bill Ritter. And I'm Liz Cho. Sade is off tonight. The victim was punched in the face after leaving a family wedding in Queens. I'm News reporter NJ Burke. is live outside the courthouse in Kew Gardens with the very latest. NJ. And no, this is not the kind of court he's used to at Wake Forest University, Queens Criminal Court here in New York, where he was arraigned about two hours ago on third degree assault charges. Tonight, his attorney expressed condolences to the victim's family, but offered no explanation for the punch that ended that man's life. No comment. Jameel Jones left criminal court with his lawyer, bowed his head and said nothing. But investigators say he's the tall, thin man wanted for four days. The man in this surveillance video who fled the scene moments after he knocked another man to the pavement with a single punch. 35-year-old Sandor Zabo, a tourist from Florida, was dead within 72 hours. It happened early Sunday morning. Detectives say Zabo had just left a family wedding, searching for his Uber driver outside a Long Island City hotel, intoxicated and banging on cars, before pounding on the window of Jones's SUV. With that, prosecutors say Jones got out and knocked Zabo unconscious. He was arraigned two hours ago on third degree assault charges. His attorney expressing sympathy tonight. The Jones family sends their deepest condolences and sympathies to the Savoy family. We won't be making any further comments. Jamil Jones is an assistant basketball coach at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. Zabo lived in Boca Raton, Florida and worked as a digital marketing executive. His sudden senseless death has left his friends and co-workers stunned. Really nice guy, easy going. I go snorkeling all the time and just a very, very nice gentleman. Happy, good guy. Always um, positive attitude, smile, trying to help out any way he can with our business. Very interested in all the people in our business. Um, just like a, a really good, good person. Well, there was no specific comment from Wake Forest University tonight. Uh, again, Jones was arraigned on third degree assault charges, but I'm told those charges could be upgraded once this case goes to a grand jury. It's called Black Americana. We thought that more than likely it wouldn't be an issue. The Franklin shop says this was black and white people buying this stuff. Let there be no doubt about that. They're mocking us. 
Black Americana collectibles continue to stir up controversy tonight in Fort Myers. We told you Wednesday about a prominent leader in the black community who called on the items to be removed from a downtown store. Well, tonight they are indeed all gone. But as NBC News Dave Elias shows us, you might be surprised uh, by what happened to them. Exactly. More than a dozen controversial black Americana collectibles just like these were wiped clean from their shelves. But the man who called for their removal wasn't expecting them to disappear the way they did. I can tell you that I, I definitely felt offended by it. Larry Aguilar is talking about these black Americana collectibles. I thought that um, they should have taken it down as quickly as possible. That was Wednesday. The next day, the store was packed with curiosity seekers. Well, it did bring in an onflow of people. People were very interested to see it and see what it was about. So much that they wiped the shelves clean. We've actually sold all of our pieces. The bigger question? who bought it. We've had, you know, blacks as well as whites come in and buy it. What's the point in collecting that? What, what you know, I, I just don't see it. Black community leader Larry Aguilar disappointed. It's sad. It's totally sad. After he called for all of the items to be removed by the store. I should have bought all those items that day when I saw them. What do you say we do with all of this memorabilia? It will give me great pleasure to see them take hammer and, and uh, wh whatever else we can find to, to blow those things up. I don't think it's practical and I think it's a shame. The owner of the Curiosity Shop off of US 41, also a place for collectibles like these, says the items are a part of history. It shows where we were and where we have now arrived. While he doesn't own these pieces that we discovered in an antique shop today, he points to these prices, which prove the items are highly sought after. The majority of the folks that are collecting these pieces are the African-American people and the community. Despite that fact, Aguilar says his fight is not over. If they're planning on bringing more of those items, you know that our community is going to have a say about that. While these items no doubt are collectible, some store owners tell me they no longer sell them because of the controversy. Others tell me they have them and they don't display them and only sell to customers who ask for them. Now to London, where the Church of England has issued an apology for the church being, quote, deeply institutionally racist. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who leads the church, expressed sorrow and shame for the decades-long failures. The church admitted to discriminating against countless black, Asian, and minority ethnic people over the past 70 years. Moving forward, he said they needed radical and decisive progress and announced plans to add more minorities to leadership panels within the church? Um, I think, of course, the legacy of empire is a mixed one. Um, but let's not pretend it is just an unbroken litany of exploitation and shame. I mean, take slavery, for instance. Britain's participation in the transatlantic slave trade is certainly a stain on our history, but let's not pretend the British invented slavery. Over a million Europeans were bought and sold in the slave markets of North Africa between the 16th century and the mid-18th century. The British Empire abolished slavery in 1807 with the Abolition of Slavery Act, making slavery illegal across the British Empire, and over 1,600 <laughs> British servicemen died as part of the okay. West African so squadron in the what is, Royal what, Navy. What is the truth? I mean, no, the British Empire abolished the slave trade in 1807, did not abolish slavery in its own until 1838, carried on buying slave produced cotton until 1888. So this idea, this is the whole problem here. The way we remember this history is so bad that we actually think we can find some comfort in a system which killed tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of people, rape, murder, torture, famine. The idea that in the 21st century, we're even having this discussion, this whiteness is a psychosis. You can't have a, a like an actual reasonable discussion because this is the kind of thing. Well, the yeah. yeah. trouble is, you say, <laughs> you, say you can't have a reasonable discussion. <laughs> but you, you say call whiteness, whiteness, a psychosis. whiteness is a psychosis. Do you think You're basically calling all white people nuts. No, that is not. Nope, that's not what I said. Well, is it whiteness I said is a that, psychosis? Is it, the, dis the discourse around whiteness, which underpins all of this and all these conversations we're having, is totally irrational. It's deluded. It has no basis in fact or reality. And the whole purpose of it is to is to perpetuate this kind. All right, Toby Young, you're a psychotic. <laughs> Because you're white. I That's not what I said. You implied okay, it. Okay, Hindi, that that said, sounds Hindi, racist. Can you, can you just explain? Because that does sound racist. Whiteness is. Well, a it is racist. racist. No, no, no. So whiteness, so whiteness is not just for white people. There are plenty of black people, Asian people who also purport the psychosis of whiteness. It's about the idea. It's about the fact that in the 21st century, 60% of British people believe that empire was a force for good. 
I mean, this is like saying the Nazis built, built motorways, so we should celebrate them. This is literally an irrational... You're, you're comparing the British Empire to Nazi Germany. You're right, there is no comparison. The British Empire did far more harm to the world for a far more... You're saying the British Empire time. was worse. Yes. But far what about, worse. What, what about, it lasted for like 300, 200 what, years. What about the role that Britain, in, in collaboration with its overseas territories, played in defeating... Nazi Germany. Had it not been for the resources and the power of the British Empire in the 1940s, Britain standing alone would not have been able to defeat, take on and defeat Nazi Germany. Oh. Surely that's something we should celebrate, not be ashamed. Are we also forgetting that the concentration camps, where were they first trialled in the British Empire? Are we also forgetting that the logic of race, that actually this is something which you can kill and murder and slaughter for, was practised heavily in the British Empire? All right, John Z. The science that underpinned the Nazis came largely from the British Empire. John Z. So it's all about... I've spoken it's to a lot of black people who feel this way. There's no doubt this is a feeling that many black people in this country feel. They feel the British Empire stands for something that oppressed their people around the world, right? Yeah, and, I get, and I get that. But do we have to go as far as changing the name of, of honours? All right, and we back on the forecast. And I want to say RP to the brother Darius Tarver and all our people who have been unjustly murdered. Luckily, the brother Simeon Brown was able to survive and tell his story. But until we start punishing people for what they do to us, and until we take control of our community and police ourselves and outsiders that come in our community, and they understand that if they harm us, it's going to come with consequences, they're gonna keep doing the same thing over and over. We are the only ones that can stop it. And that's why we have to build our institutions. And to do that, we have to rebuild our economy. And we can do that right now. Right now, we can elect the most successful black business people and put them on a committee strictly to help fund and grow black businesses. And as long as they stay transparent and do what they say they're gonna do, all of us can contribute to it, whether it be $1, $5, $100, a $1 million. And that'll make it easier for black businesses to come to our communities so it'll be easier for us to support them. And in return, they can hire us. And once we start circulating our dollars, we can build our schools, we can build our police, whatever we need. But we have to put aside our petty differences and our beliefs. And once we understand the situation we're in, we'll realize we don't have any other choice but to do that. Now, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, man, we have got to start standing for something or we're going to keep falling for anything.